Hello, everybody. My name is Stina Troyer, and I'm a biologist with Harbor Wild Watch. And I'm excited to kick off our 2021 Science Social Speaker Series here with Dr. Sarah Graven. And before we get started and introduce her, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how tonight's going to go. Uh, and then we're going to start all our Cocktails and Fishtails 2021 series with our speaker's favorite cocktail and their favorite fish tail. So Sarah, I'm going to let you think on that for a little bit as, yeah. as I introduce the evening. Um, we're so excited to have you. So thanks for being here. Um, so yeah, we get to start off with a star presentation this year, um, talking about sunflower sea stars and them getting listed as critically endangered. Um, but before we get started with that talk, uh, I just want to let you know, for those of you tuning in, uh, you're welcome to ask questions in the comments because I'll be moderating those at the end. So I'll gather them and then feed them to Sarah um, as we go along. So your questions get to be answered live tonight. And uh, we think that's a pretty cool feature of our, our new virtual situation here. So thanks for bearing with us in that. And of course, we always like to know where you're tuning in from. So uh, let us know where you're watching from in the comments as well as any of those questions. Uh, and then at the end of this broadcast, uh, this video will be posted in full on our Harbor Wild Watch Facebook page, as well as it'll get popped over to our YouTube page, which speaking of, we would love, love, love and so appreciate if all of you at the end of this presentation to pop over to the Gig Harbor Wild Watch Facebook or YouTube page and please subscribe. Uh, right now we're at 662 subscribers. So we could make a chunk of difference tonight. Uh, if we get to a thousand, that will let Rachel and I uh, have the ability to go live from YouTube in the field. And that is a way better platform than things like Facebook or TikTok for uh, bringing uh, the beach into the classroom. So please do that after tonight's presentation. Um, and so with no further ado, uh, I am excited to introduce Dr. Sarah Grabo. Uh, she's a research associate at the Oregon State University, and she's a lead author on the study that uh, prompted the addition of sunflower stars to be listed as critically endangered back in was it December 2020. <laughs> ended the year on kind of a, a sad note there. So um, I think we'll get to hear more about how community science efforts helped um, lead to that listing and why, why community science is important and how we can better understand the change in this population and um, maybe what we can be done to help recover those sunflower stars. So um, I know that we have Harbor Wild Watch volunteers tuning in tonight who have actually done some sea flower or some sea star surveys uh, as part of our community science beach monitoring with Harbor Wild Watch. So uh, lots of excited people uh, tuning in tonight. So with that, let me just spotlight Sarah and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me. Um, and I just wanted to point out I, from my end, it says attendee zero. And I just wanted to make sure that the settings are right and that yeah. that's not actually true. <laughs> we're doing this fancy thing where we're on okay. the, and then it's like um, <laughs> head over to the Facebook. Okay, just double checking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and of course we get to start. So Sarah, please tell yeah. us what is your favorite cocktail? My favorite cocktail is actually one of my family's own making. It's called the Doan Hatton. Um, so the story is my mom, when she was first dating, my dad visited my grandparents who drank, uh, my grandfather drank Manhattan straight with just like whiskey, vermouth and cherry, but that's a quite a strong cocktail. So my, gr my mom was a total wimp and like spat it out. <laughs> And uh, so he added some seven up for her. And so now that's called a Doan hat and, and that's our, our family drink. But you really can't skimp on the vermouth and and the cherries. You gotta get the fancy stuff. You can't get that like, you know, oh, yeah. the cheapest stuff on the, on the thing. It makes it much better if you go for the fancy <laughs> vermouth. Um, and then my favorite fish tail, I was about 15 and it was one of my first times abalone diving with my dad and we're in a 
kayak and we finished our dive and I got a one my one big huge abalone for the day which was all I got but um the uh, anchor on the kayak wouldn't come up and so my dad was like hey go get it go get back in the water and swim down and and undo the anchor of the kayak and so he we thought it was under a rock right so I jump in I dive down to the bottom and there's a flipping giant Pacific octopus <laughs> sitting on top of the anchor. And it is so big and heavy that we actually couldn't pull the anchor up. And so I just like shoo this octopus off the bottom of the anchor so that we could get out and get back to shore. So that was one of the coolest. It was one of my first times underwater. So that was really exciting in that moment. Um, that is, all right. Those I are my like, fish yeah, tails and cocktails. Every good fish tail has like, <laughs> so it was the octopus like, this big <laughs> it was like this big well i mean it was certainly big enough to where like when we yanked the anchor it was strong enough to hold the anchor to the seafloor so it was it was not a tiny animal <laughs> perfect way to yeah all right i'm gonna share my screen is that is that good, You're good yeah all right okay so today I'm going to be talking, um, I, I named it the misalignment of the stars. It is um, a review of the recent uh, listing of the sunflower sea star, which you can see here as critically endangered, which is a project I spearheaded the last year or so with a bunch of folks um, listed here. And it was sponsored by the Nature Conservancy and I'm at Oregon State University. And so, um, here we go. All right. So <clears throat> sea star wasting disease uh, was a disease outbreak that began in 2013. It started in California and Washington actually separately, which was super strange. Um, and over the next year spread into Oregon and over the next year or two also spread all the way up to Alaska. So it ended up being like a Baja Mexico to Alaska geography, which is gigantic. Um, it affected over 20 species, and we think it's the largest marine epidemic in a wildlife species ever. Um, gigantic. We think it's a virus. There's still some juries out on that. Um, there are some others who think that it's maybe um, not a virus and environmentally driven or a virus interacting with the environment it's really unclear and it's complicated and we still have no really solid idea of why this happened in the first place um it's still happening so you can still find sea sea uh, sea stars out there that have this wasting symptom um and it really uh just filled the entire coastline it didn't really skip anywhere it went all the way every and hit every spot um, these animals were, some animals were much more affected than others. So I study both of these species. This is Pisaster ochraceus, the ochre star that you'll find in a tide pool when you're, when you're tide pooling. And they have five arms and they're that keystone species that everyone uh, likes to talk about. They eat lots of stuff. And then there's the sunflower sea star. And those are, um, if you haven't seen one before, they have like 20 arms. They are huge and slimy. They get the size of an extra large pizza. Um, and they're one of the most striking animals you, you've ever seen. And uh, they actually were hit the absolute hardest of all the species that um, we know of. And uh, this is some footage from the Pisestro Cratius, the ochre star. Um, infected. And so we collected these animals when I was in Bodega Marine Lab down in California and videotaped them over about 24 hours. And what happens is they get these like white lesions on their bodies, the lesions grow, and then they actually start losing arms. As you can see, these arms just kind of crawling around <laughs> the tank on their own. It's really creepy. Um, so zombie arms, and then they just sort of melt into a pile of goo. And it's, it's really revolting. And they, the whole ocean floor and all the tide pools were just covered in like zombie arms of sea stars um, and sea star plops. Um, 
And this occurred over, you know, two, three years. It was really at its peak. And now that we're sort of out emerging from that epidemic peak, we're at the point where we need to really figure out like how bad was it and are these systems and these species going to recover or not? And so um, some good news is and that I won't be talking about today is that that Pisaster, the one with five arms that you see tide pooling, seems to be doing quite a bit better. Um, we had a lot of recruitment in Oregon, um, so lots of babies landing in Oregon, and they, uh, and some in California, and they seem to be on their way back um, pretty much all over the place, except for maybe Southern California. But Pycnopodia, on the other hand, we kept, you know, expecting the same thing to happen for, for new babies to arrive to repopulate the, the systems and it, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting and it just wasn't happening. So about a year and a half, two years ago, um, it started to become really clear that it, we needed to really understand the like gravity of the situation. And so I, um, and some colleagues, including Sarah Hamilton, who's one of the graduate students in my lab, um, got together and did um, an IUCN red list assessment. So we did a um, global assessment of the population of sunflower sea stars. This was all work um, that was part of what we formed as the Pycnopodia working group. So Pycnopodia is the sunflower sea stars species name. And that working group's priorities were to ID knowledge gaps, like what don't we know? What do we know about this species? How can we help them? And then that first order of business was that red list assessment that I'm going to mostly focus on today. So the red list is, um, it's part of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So it's a global uh, list. It's uh, associated with the United Nations and it's a not legally binding. It's more of like an inventory and its goal is to assess the health of the world. And so they have different levels of um, status of different species. So they range from like least concern or near threatened. And then these three in the middle are, are called the threatened categories. And so we were trying to figure out which of these three levels do the sunflower sea stars fall into? And then they, you know, past that there's extinct and extinct in the wild. So that's, that's the really, that's one we want to avoid, right? <laughs> and so all of these um, threatened levels are intended to, to figure out how threatened each of these, each species is with potential extinction. And so that's the goal here. One other thing I would note is um, we had a long discussion actually about whether we were going to do this IUCN red listing or do the United States Endangered Species Act um, listing, which has really similar levels, but the um, implementation of each of those is very different. So for example, the IUCN red list is really about like understanding and, um, and just like awareness, but the, U.S. Endangered Species Act comes with legal protection. And at first we were like, oh yeah, legal protection, we need that. And then it became very clear that, you know, if we were to put legal protection on these guys, um, you could pick up a Pycnopodia in your crab trap and that would be a felony. And we were like, oh, <laughs> this is a bad idea. So, um, because, so we don't think legal protection is necessary at this point. Um, and that's mostly because A, people encounter them accidentally and we don't want that to be a crime. And B, um, we don't think that human activity is really the main cause. So it was a disease that may or may not be tied to climate change and um, no like fishing activity or habitat destruction or anything that any one human is doing is really influencing the species. And so we didn't wanna go down that rabbit hole and that is off the table for right now. So back to the actual assessment. Um, we gathered global data, as many as we could, on the status of Pycnopodia. All the dots on here are data sets or uh, surveys that we actually fed in. 
They covered 12 regions from Baja to the Aleutians. 67 different people contributed data or knowledge in some form to this project, including 31 data sets. They spanned 53 years and we ended up with over 61,000 surveys, which was pretty staggering. And the first thing we wanted to pull out of it is some information about how the disease actually happened amongst all these regions. So this is a um, figure showing uh, the time down here. So 2012, so just before sea star wasting began to 2020. And then the Y is the predicted incidence of Pycnopodia. So that means based on our data, if you went out to a site what are the chances of you seeing a sea star at that time? And so these are model output predictions. So they're not, they're based on true data, but they're not, you know, the, the, tight, the fits aren't that tight in real life. But um, what we're trying to do is figure out what is the shape of these declines in presence essentially over time. So as we go along, say this line, this is uh, Southeast Alaska, we start out at like almost every time you go out, you see a sea star. And over time, your chances of seeing a sea star decline. Um, but they're not crazy declines, right? We've got still got at half the time you go out, you see a sea star. So that's the shape of the decline in, oh, sorry, that was Southeast Alaska. But if you look at like the shape of the decline in say, let's go with my um, home state, Oregon, you had a pretty good chance before and over the last couple of years, your chance has declined almost to nothing. And if you're in central California, you had a really good chance before of seeing a sea star and now your chance is essentially zero. So these shapes of this tells you not only how fast the population is how, how um, large the drop was, but how fast the drop was. So we can see that in say Baja here and Central California here, the decline is steep. So it drops fast. And that means the disease itself ripped through those populations really quickly. Whereas places in the North, like in these cooler colors, the, po the populations declined, but it wasn't as quick. And so this gives us information about the fact, or this tells us that down in the southern half of the range, essentially Oregon South, we had earlier declines that happened faster and they were more severe. So what does this mean for the whole sea star population? So these are global data on the population size of the sea stars. So we're talking, um, this is like 3 billion here. Um, so we have data way back, but I just showing from 27, 2007 to 2019. And what it does before wasting, so wasting happens in 2013, is it bounces around in these purples. And, um, and actually 2014 was a good year. <clears throat> But then wasting started to hit and we end up with like sequentially between 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, it just drop, 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 drop. And now we're at 19 and I will tell you 20 is even lower. And so overall, what we found is the size of the population globally declined by over 90%. Um, and our estimate is that over 5.75 billion animals died, which puts it as the most devastating marine epidemic in ever. Um, and that's just for the sunflower stars. So that's not including the 19 other species that were, that were hit. And that qualifies it for a critically endangered listing through that IUCN red list. So that's the global number. 90 percent ish but when we look at the regions i think the story gets even more interesting so these are our the same map i showed you a moment ago and what you can see is that down in baja to oregon and even up into the washington outer coast right here 
we had over 97 and usually more like 99% declines um, all throughout that. And if you get up in, once you get up into the Salish Sea and British Columbia and Southeast Alaska, it's like 92, 90, 95. Um, same with the Gulf of Alaska. Out in the Aleutians and the West Gulf, we have actually a lot less data out there. Um, most of these data points are on here are deep water trawls where they're really rare anyway. And so um, the data out here are actually pretty thin. So I'm not positive that that's a 61%. It could be higher, it could be lower. Um, kind of like the jury's still out on that, that end of the, the range. But where we have good data, <laughs> the story's pretty dismal. So um, the other thing I'll note is um, these populations have declined by that much, but we're, and we also have analyzed like the more recent past three years, say, for all these regions, and we're not really seeing any indication that they're recovering in any region. So even in places like Alaska, where there's still 5% of them left, those 5% don't seem to be growing. The other thing is, down in or essentially Washington down to Baja, it seems to have flatlined to the point where like we're seeing maybe one or two here and there. Um, and, and actually in California, we haven't even seen one since 2017, I think, which is pretty crazy. The next thing we wanted to ask is, so that was the magnitude of the decline, but we're are they now? Like, where are the populations still hanging on? And what we're finding, um, so this graph is, oh, and I actually hid something up here. So um, the white is zero animals, and the blue is at least some animals. So we've got, um, these data are the most recent data, so they're like the last couple years. And what you can see is, um, most of Washington down to Baja is white. And that means zero animals. And effectively what we're finding with our, we have these range contraction models running right now. And their old range, oopsies, their old range limit was down in Baja, but their new range limit is like Salish Sea, which is a freaking huge range contraction. Like, you know, the entirety of the US coastline is how big the range contraction was. Um, that said, there seems to be around 600 million left is the estimate, although 500, oh, 5.75, that's wrong. 5.75 billion died. So it's, there's a lot left, but a lot died, even a lot, a lot more died. Um, we have quite thinned populations in Alaska, but they're still there. Um, and BC and Salish Sea are really patchy right now. So we'll get like one spot that has a bunch and then most spots have none. So, but it's not all bad. We've got, um, so this is a photograph um, from one of the fjords in British Columbia that's in First Nations land. And there are actually four hidden Pycnopodia in this picture. So I'm gonna let you stare at this for a moment and see if you can find all four of them. Um, and this was taken just um, last September, so it wasn't that long ago. And these four animals are pretty big. They're big adults and they're big and healthy. And it seems like the fjords of British Columbia have been some of the places where the disease either skipped or, or didn't hit nearly as hard as other places. So we are finding pockets, which is good. Um, and the next thing uh, is, why does this matter? So this huge decline has occurred, this huge range contraction has occurred, but you know, not everyone cares about sunflower sea stars and not everyone has even never seen one. So what does that matter for the general public and the world. Um, and the answer to that is kelp. So uh, Pycnopodia, those sunflower sea stars, are at the top of the food chain of the kelp forest, and they died. 
in like 2013 to 15. And right following that, we seem to have gotten a big, what we call a recruitment event or a baby boom of these purple sea urchins, which are Pycnopodia's food. They, they hunt these little guys. And um, so their predators gone and they had a great year for reproduction. And then right around the same time um, or just after we had a marine heat wave called the blob um, that hit the US West Coast and just had this big warm water blob that sat off the coast for like over a year. And that warm water kills kelp. So kelp don't like warm water. They died. And the, so the, the whole coastline of kelp sort of crashed. And instead of being able to just rebound the next year, these veritable horde of hungry sea urchins was waiting with no predator to keep them from just marching through a kelp forest and mowing it down. And so what we're seeing in especially Northern California, but in Oregon and in British Columbia and in Salish Sea, the urchins seem to be increasing and the kelp are decreasing. And it's not to say that like Pycnopodia, the sunflower stars are the only reason that has happened, but it's pretty clear that they, this probably wouldn't be happening if they were still there. So um, that is important because kelp do all sorts of things for us as humans and for the ecosystem at large. So um, kelp are the, oops, got a little typo there. Um, kelp are the trees of the ocean. They make forests, right? But they're actually even better. <laughs> than trees. So firstly, they sequester carbon like crazy, they grow like crazy, and that can help mitigate climate change. Secondly, unlike trees, kelp are food for a lot of animals and they, their bodies feed uh, and uh, tons of different creatures. And then they make these big forest habitats, right, underwater. And so that creates habitat that nurtures just hundreds of different types of marine organisms, especially baby marine organisms that want somewhere to hide as they grow up. And then because of these things, they provide food and economic income for all sorts of humans in coastal communities. So for example, kelp benefit the red abalone fishery. So red abalone eat kelp. Um, they benefit the red urchin fishery because red urchins eat kelp. Um, and they benefit rockfish because baby rockfish live in kelp. And they benefit dungeness crab because baby dungeness crab live in kelp. And so without the kelp and without the sea stars, all there's a big domino effect on a bunch of the animals that we as humans and as, as just coastal residents care about. So the gravity of the situation is big. And we formed this Pycnopodia working group to try to help address some of these major issues. So our first finding from this IUCN assessment is that there's really quite little chance of rapid recovery at this point without intervention, at least for the Washington outer coast and south. So the Salish Sea seems to have pockets enough that it could recover on its own, but um, California, you know, good luck getting sea stars in the next five years without help. Um, so what we've been doing is uh, some of our members are working on methods for captive breeding out at Friday Harbor Labs and at the Seattle Aquarium. They're raising little babies. They're like a year old now and like, uh, you can't see like this big. <laughs> um, but that uh, is being ironed out so we could hopefully raise bunches of them in the lab, you know, release them when they're the size of, size of a quarter onto a reef, and then they would grow up out there and help maintain and flip that ecosystem back um, by eating urchins. 
The other thing we're working on is a bunch of Pycnopodia kelp urchin interaction experiments. So it's one thing to say, you know, sea stars eat urchins and urchins eat kelp, ergo uh, Pycnopodia can save kelp. We actually have to show that experimentally. And so one of the projects I'm working on this summer is um, going to be up in Sitka, Alaska, where we have enough Pycnopodia to work with, uh, to try and do a bunch of experiments in the field and in the lab to understand, you know, like how many sea stars do you need on a reef to keep the urchins in check and to benefit the kelp. And then the last thing is we still don't know the cause of that disease. And we have no way to test whether, see, say, a given animal is um, disease free. So right now we can't easily or you know honestly morally take animals say from British Columbia and move them down to Oregon and say okay perfect we'll just translocate them and they'll be good to go because we can't tell whether those animals are healthy or not like we don't want to go and bring the disease down from British Columbia to Oregon um, so getting that sort of test for the disease is critical like imagine if we we're trying to deal with COVID and we had no COVID tests, you know, that, like a year ago when we had no COVID tests. Like that's how unreliable or, or unknowable the consequences of our actions are right now. Um, the other, so those are the, the oral Pycnopodia Recovery Working Group is really focused on the sea stars themselves and how they can benefit the ecosystems. But we're also working on the other end of it, which is um, trying to recover kelp directly. So we have formed the Oregon Kelp Alliance, ORCA, which is fun. Um, so the goals of ORCA are first doing kelp forest monitoring, actually directly cultivating kelp. So uh, gathering kelp spores and planting them at new reefs or reefs where they've been, um, uh, where they've declined. Uh, working on the best methods for urchin culling. So urchin culling means like going out and directly like removing the urchins from the reef. That type of approach is certainly something that like costs a lot of money and is only effective on a small spatial scale. But you know, if we can target some kelp oases and remove the urchins from those, you know, localized reefs and get the kelp back and get the kelp established again, then those kelp can grow up and seed the stuff next door. Um, so <clears throat> that's one target. And then the last, another target is, you know, we've got urchin culling is one thing, but what do you do with all those urchins once you've got them? And so uni is urchin row or uh, urchin gonad. And that is a really popular ingredient on sushi. So we're working on now ways to create essentially a sushi market for these urchins. Um, normally sushi uh, is only from the red urchin, which are the, the bigger urchins with the long, longer spines and they're more rare. But we're working on, you know, ways to collect these urchins, say fatten them up in a, in a fish tank and then use, put those in the market and give a demand to help reduce these urchins um, through that like economic solution. Um, the last one is that sea star reintroduction that um, hopefully I think uh, will happen someday. And I, I personally think that, you know, we can do all the kelp regrowing and the urchin culling that we want, but without a predator in a system to control these urchins, it's going to be quite futile and expensive and just revert itself back. So um, I think that the key to recovering some of these systems is really to um, get that, those sea stars back. Um, so some of the things you can do to get involved, we have um, the Oregon Kelp Alliance. We're on Twitter at Oregon Kelp. Uh, we're probably on Facebook too, but I didn't write the handle. Um, the other thing, you know, y'all are in Gig Harbor, so we're looking for sea stars up there. Um, 
If you see one, please um, submit your sightings to seastarwasting.org. So that's an um, interface you can submit observations to regardless of whether the animal is healthy or not. And that um, website is for everywhere. So you could do that if you're in California or Alaska or wherever. Um, the other one that's quite a bit like you more user friendly is iNaturalist. If you haven't downloaded iNaturalist to your phone yet, you should totally do it. It's this really cool app by the California Academy of Science. You can take a picture of any plant, animal, whatever, and it'll be like, oh, this is an oak tree. And um, it has all this AI to tell you what picture you're looking at. Um, but those are really important data because they can give us, you know, much more coverage and um, and like store this huge database of where these sea stars are being found. And then finally, if you know you're a diver and you really want to get involved, there's a, a program called Reef, the Reef Environmental Education Fund. A ton of the data that we used to um, understand the declines in sea stars came from them. And they're really great um, citizen science and community science group that does all sorts of like scuba surveys. And then if you have any questions or you see something really cool or interesting or weird, or you found a sea star in your crab pot, or you find a baby sea star in a tide pool, um, you can shoot me an email. Um, we wanna know where they are, especially if you're in like coastal Washington, Oregon or California. These sightings are so rare, I can count them on my hands at this point. So uh, please tell us and with that, I spent uh, less time on this so that I could spend more time with you all asking questions. Um, but to say, before I finish, there were tons and tons of people who helped with this and um, from all over the place. And these are, these are the list of them. And so this type of collaborative research can't occur without um, the efforts of tons and tons of people. And with that, I will stop my screen share and take your questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sarah, so much. That's, uh, uh, I think, fascinating and a little, like, <laughs> a little sad, too. It's sad. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is sad. Uh, I know. But we can do something about it. We totally yeah. can. Yes, there is yeah. some hope, which is. Yeah in all our situations here, which is great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, big round of applause from our Facebook audience and we as well. And we do have a couple questions coming in. Um, I know I was wondering in the video that you showed of the like very morbid, like the sea star ripping itself apart, there was the healthy one and it almost looked like it was running. I mean, I know that, uh, it, but did that one yeah. end? Uh, that one ended badly. Yeah, I just showed the beginning of that video. It took a day, couple days to, for that one to succumb, but um, it didn't. It didn't make it. Yeah, I can't tell whether there that one was running away, yeah. or it was just like exploring. You know, it's it, it certainly was like, why am I in this fish tank? <laughs> How do I get out of this fish tank? Easy to anthropomorphize, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in a glass case of emotion. Um, yeah, but that was on super speed, right? So it wasn't really running that fast. Totally. Um, another question, which um, I think I'm assuming the answer is sea star wasting syndrome, but Jessica is wondering what was the catalyst event? Um, and I think that's in regards to maybe the overall decline. Yeah, yeah. So we really don't know why it happened in the first place. Um, there are some places where the, the, out, the beginning of the outbreak coincided with warm water but then so that was in like the salish sea it coincided with warm water but um down in california and in oregon it didn't at all coincide with warm water and so that's where i'm saying we don't really know the trigger right we don't know why it happened in the first place and if it's a virus it could be just random mutation right just like covid is sort of a random mutation of an already existing virus that made it just really lethal and virulent. Um, this could just be something like that, right? Where it's not, these, these sorts of epidemics do just naturally happen. 
But what is very clear is the reason it's been so bad is has a lot to do with warming water. And so in places where it was warmer than normal, the disease was more lethal. It goes faster. It kills more animals. Um, and then the other thing that's really super clear is that in you know the warmer half of its range, it's essentially gone now. So though it's not necessarily climate change itself, warmer water makes it worse. And we're in, the, in this state where we have the southern half of its range has been wiped out. And I don't think, I think that's what we're going to see a lot with climate change, where it's like, it's not any one moment, but like this sort of like mounting pressure that like breaks a dam, you know? Um, it's kind of, of yeah it's like the same as a wildfire right like you don't get wildfires every day you just get one huge one <laughs> that wipes something out okay. well so i think that answers Lindsay's question about you know is there a theory of why there's more drastic decline in the southern regions so warmer temperatures yeah that's it's pretty clear that that has a lot to do with it um those the southern half of the range was already less populated than the northern half but we're working on, you know, trying to parse that out. And what it seems to be showing is like, it, it's not just 90% of them died everywhere. And that leaves the Southern half with nothing left. It's yeah. that it was actually worse in the Southern half. Gotcha. The blob. What a creative name for a <laughs> The blob. <laughs> um, I have another question from Jen. Um, so I think... I'm assuming this article has come across your way, but wondering what you think about it not being a virus instead of bacterial mm. or organic growth that suffocates the stars. Do you have an hour? <laughs> Presentation round two. <laughs> Presentation round two. Um, that's a great question. And, and those data just came out. And so um, that paper suggests, to give you a review, that paper suggests that um, when you have animals in a fish tank and you either decrease the oxygen level in that fish tank or you add what's called dissolve organic matter. So you add phytoplankton or you add some sort of nutrient to the water um, that increases the number of animals that die. So few things. Firstly, that one was in a fish tank, right? And so we don't, and it was done recently. So it's not at all sure that those animals that were collected for that experiment didn't already have the disease when they were collected. And then by stressing them out, it made them symptomatic. Um, also, three of so the the sample size on that was like 10 animals i think per treatment and three of the ones in the controls died <laughs> yeah, so i i'm not as, as much as like that totally shows that if you have stressful conditions like dissolve low oxygen or more nutrients in the water that can make the disease worse like i don't disagree with that um at all but i'm not positive that I don't, it's similar to the climate change thing where it like can worsen it, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's the trigger, right? Um, and so also in that paper, they showed like this one site, it's uh, outbreak timing was preceded by a phytoplankton bloom, which is suggestive, but this disease occurred from Mexico to Alaska and we have sensors all over the place and there's no indication that there was a low oxygen event or a phytoplankton event at the same time as it happened on that global scale and yeah. so there's I think there is certain, it's certainly a, like a new hypothesis, right? That we should investigate, but it's 
not like, oh, we figured it out. Kelly's closed, moving on <laughs> at all. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of whispers and bustle in the, in the sea star wasting world about that right now. I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, there, uh, I know with Harbor Wild Watch, we used to bring a kiddie pool to programs because, right, we have the world's largest sea star three feet across ish. Yeah. We needed a big tank to contain it for, yeah. to like show it off to people. And so I think Lindsay's next question is um, what gives you the most hope regarding the possible rebound of the species? Like, I'm imagining the day where we get to dust off <laughs> the kiddie pool and, you know, bring, bring back the sunflower star here. Well, um, I'll tell you that last week I got an email from a guy in Whidbey Island who has had a recruitment event in uh, Holmes Harbor. And so we're seeing, you know, we're seeing them try. <laughs> uh, they, that's not to say that's like, you know, get out of the, out of the woods um, because the disease is still here. And what we've seen in, especially like British Columbia is, there have been, you know, babies that land, grow, and then they die at like a year or two old. And so I won't, you know, jump up and down quite yet, but um, they, they're trying and they're not gone, at least not in the Salish Sea and North. And so that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of geography. There's a lot of animals out there and they're um, broadcast spawners. So each female can make like a millions of eggs every year and you know all we really really need is like a good year for those animals to fertilize well get transported for the larvae to all get fed and for them to land and, and there's a lot of like if thens and steps along the way that can make that process kaput but um I don't think they're in danger of going extinct, but I do think ecologically, that's what I'm worried about. So I'm not worried about the, the species. I'm worried about the kelp forests and the consequences for um, especially Oregon and California, where we have this predator that used to be, that is super important and it's now missing. And that breaking that positive feedback loop of like there's no sea stars so now there's too many urchins and not enough kelp and so the kelp can't grow and they can't make babies and when they do make babies the urchins eat it and then the next year it's worse and worse and worse and worse and breaking that cycle of um too many urchins not enough kelp is what um i'm more concerned about than about the sea stars themselves yeah, I feel like we could really, like, there's some good social media potential for the, like, urchin ranching, like, give them a cute little hat and, like, your little urchin wrangling boots, like, I'm- Oh my I'm gosh, the urchin cowboy. they will wear a hat. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So they, <laughs> they will wear a hat. Oh, the urchin. Um, <laughs> yes, because they, um, so in, naturally, they are out there and they've got these little tube feet and spines, right? And so- um, in the wild, they pick up shells and put them on their heads to, um, we think, protect them from UV light. So like protect them from getting sunburned, which is hilarious. But um, if you give them a tiny cowboy hat, they'll put it on and stay there. <laughs> so we'll have urchin cowboys. Yeah, yeah. Urchin ranch. Cowboys. That's not confusing at all. Cowgirls. <laughs> Cowgirls, yes. Cow. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We need um, to give them some tiny boots too. Yeah. Uh, we've definitely noticed like leather stars are one star that like is just like we go out to Fox Island Sandspit and they are like you know do beach walk you see over a hundred. Um, is yeah. that is there the question is have you seen mm, I'm gonna guess is it disease in leather stars and the hairy helmet crabs since 2013? I'm not oh, okay. I'm curious what the hairy helmet crabs. I'm assuming that says hairy hermit crabs. Maybe hermit. Um, yeah, so um, the leather stars seem to have not been affected by the disease nearly as badly as, uh, especially as Pycnopodia. Like they got, some of them died, but it was, I think the estimate was like 
certainly less than half. You think like with their um, ability to like pull their guilt, like they have a thicker skin surface? I don't know if it has that. It seems like the bat stars and the leather stars made it through. And those two species are scavengers. And so, and there's evidence that um, the disease is promoted by microbiome imbalance, which is kind of wackadoo, but um, essentially like the animals who are top predators got hammered. And the animals who are like lowly scavengers that are like eating dead stuff all the time, didn't. And something about their ability to handle like weird gross stuff <laughs> made them okay but I, that's my totally very like cursory hypothesis based on which species got hit um so the leather stars didn't get hit so bad so badly um and that's probably why you're seeing a bajillion of them um and maybe now they don't have as many competitors as they used to who knows um and then the hairy hermit crabs weren't affected by this disease i think so, rachel did just pop in to clarify that yeah hairy helmet crabs so kind of like the like telemesis species um like the umbrella crabs um there yeah. well, i call it a helmet crab um okay. but they're kind of yellow and they've got like the little bristles um oh. but rachel's saying um we've definitely I, like i can vouch for the See, observing more of the leather stars, but I think she's also observed more helmet crabs in the inner tunnel. Okay. Yeah, I um, haven't seen that. Um, but, uh, and, and there's no indication that this disease hit um, taxa other than sea stars. Um, so we were looking at sea cucumbers and sea urchins because they're the most closely related. To we were watching them to see if they would get hit by the disease too and it seemed like they didn't and so um and crabs don't seem like they at least if they did die it was some probably from something else <laughs> i gotta look up a helmet crab now i don't even think i know what that is they're, they're really fun uh, maybe they're I'm not down sure here we have a tiktok for that so oh, <laughs> we'll okay cool. your way. okay <laughs> And then another good question from Lindsay uh, is the current number of community scientists out there providing enough data on this problem or is there a need for more? Mm, so there's always a need for more. It's never bad to have more. Um, I think we need more in some places and I, the Salish Sea, you guys are kicking total butt on how much community science is happening there like it is active um so we have no shortage of data there the if you guys want to take some weekend trips out to the washington outer coast though <laughs> we need more data out there like um we're really really thin on that coastline and then um there's quite a bit up in like bc near vancouver and then as soon as you get up into like the fjords and north of Vancouver Island, we have like almost nothing. And then you get up into Alaska and there's like pockets around towns, but um, super thin again. So um, yes, we need more, but um, it's definitely asymmetrical and totally correlated with how many people live in a place. Well, that for me at least is good encouragement for it. Okay, let's plan some Harbor Wild Watch field trips. That yeah, <laughs> go out to the go out to the outer coast. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna give it just a couple more seconds. I think I touched on all the questions in our comments. Um, we're getting some woot woots on mentioning positive feedback loops. Every high school oh, yeah. biology teacher thanks you for that mention. <laughs> Positive feedback loops, they're the worst. <laughs> or the best, depending on the situation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that is also maybe a good, we might get uh, someone to speak to declining kelp um, for a future Cocktails and Fishtails presentation, because that's definitely, I mean, you know. Yeah, quite it's the a whole issue. thing. So, it is quite uh, the issue, yeah. 
Yeah, well, is there anything else you'd like to leave us on before we wrap up this evening? Um, no, that's, that's it. You know, the seastarwasting.org site is great if you guys want to check out like what the symptoms look like, what the species look like, um, how to submit observations. Certainly, you know, reef is a great resource um, if you really want to go out and collect data. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, keep voting. <laughs> Keep pressuring politicians to do responsible things with the environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think, and if, of course, if you'd like to get involved with some sea star surveys, um, once it's safe to meet in person again, the Harbor Wild Watch will be out there doing our summer and winter beach monitoring, and that's always part of them. So we're happy to be your connection point. But this was just such a, I don't know, a, there's a glimmer of hope in this presentation yeah. as we, um, you know, kick off. But this was a great, great start to our 2021 Cocktails and Fishtails series. And we're so thankful that you could virtually join us. It's lovely to yeah. digitally meet you. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, the community science stuff is super, super important. Like I said a moment ago, but like those 61,000 data points we had, you know, 75, 80% of them were from groups like yours. So thank you. And those are invaluable when we try to do a lot of these big global assessments. Uh, part of me is like embarking on entering some of our beach monitoring data into a database. And so, yeah, I was like, who's your data enterer for all of that? That's a huge amount of... <laughs> me, I am the data enterer. <laughs> but it's, it's helpful when somebody has a well-managed database they can send me that is not, you know, <laughs> I don't have to spend a lot of time cleaning up. <laughs> um, well, thank you again. I'm going to pop over and go ahead and end our live. So for all of you out there, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate um, all your comments and questions and look forward to having you join us next month with our bug chef. Uh, more information on that to come and um, of course, stay tuned for our other digital programs coming up. Uh, I know we'll be doing some wetland walks as well as some Scansy House science program. So um, we've got all sorts of digital things coming your way from myself and Rachel. So, uh, and of course, Lindsay is out there running tech for us. So our small team is mighty in the environmental education world. And um, if you liked what you saw tonight, feel free to share that with your friends. That's a really fun, easy way and free for you to uh, support Harbor Wild Watch um, that kind of runs those algorithms up and gets us out there um, and inspiring stewardship of the Salish Sea to more people. And of course, uh, shout out to folks already donating out there. We appreciate that so much. Um, uh, that can be done on this link as well as through our website. So we appreciate that as well. And uh, with that, we always like to say, learn, have fun. So thanks for tuning in and I'm over here trying to find the right button. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have any good, any good jokes, uh, Sarah, as I try and find where I end us? Oh, man. I don't think so. <laughs> Just imagine urchins with cowboy hats on. Urchins with cowboy hats on. <laughs> OK, I found the button with that. Learn to have fun, everybody. Bye, y'all. Thank <laughs> you.